Then we will be because pictures, pictures, pastors, pastors. We are very um, happy, honoured to um, be able to give a few thoughts and reflections on the subject of um, leadership, and uh, to give us all the, the chance to really look into this whole subject and perhaps to approach the, the subject from uh, such angles as what is a good leader, what kind of leaders are we trying to, uh, to create and to support, um, what are the conditions which support the, the arising of more and more of these kinds of leaders, um, how can we prevent uh, obstacles uh, to good leadership from arising, indeed identifying those obstacles and um, looking at ways to prevent them arising or to uh, reduce or eradicate those that uh, have already arisen and looking at the um, restructure of leadership and different styles of leadership um, and perhaps looking at the uh, various uh, pros and cons um, of the different um, styles of leadership that we that we can see around us in this world these days, and um, perhaps um, in the business world and in the in the world in general. Certainly, um, we can see, I think, quite clear differences between the traditional Asian uh, models, um, in which the hierarchical system um, is stressed, and the much flatter. Um, less hierarchical systems developed in the West, uh, looking at the, um, the optimum uh, kind of organization, perhaps uh, returning for some inspiration to the uh, Buddhist suttas. Now, perhaps I will start there, um, because I think there, are, there is an awful lot to be learned from uh, the Tripitaka, from the suttas, from the, from the um, Vinaya, uh, Vinaya. And with our faith in, um, in the Buddha as a fully enlightened um, being, then uh, that includes a uh, faith in his ability to create the wisest kind of structures for uh, community living and, for, and to enable effective um, leadership. And as you know, he chose uh, for the monastic order, which is the ideal society, or that society within a society, uh, which is meant to give moral spiritual leadership to the larger society, that a hierarchical um, system uh, was was devised, but a hierarchical system with all the members are there um, through their own volition. Um, It's a voluntary organization, which uh, makes a large difference. Um, But There is also a very important uh, safeguard to prevent um, those at the the peak of the pyramid uh, from the leaders from taking advantage of those at the bottom. Um, And that is the adherence to the monastic discipline. And in the uh, Theravadan uh, monastic system, we we do make a great point of this, that even if a monk um, has been ordained for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, even if he is believed to be an enlightened being, he has to keep all of the uh, video regulations that there is no exception uh, for enlightened beings, no exception for leaders. And in fact, um, a leader's responsibility is uh, to promote respect for the regulations, the agreed conventions by which community lives. Um, through his own adherence to to them, even though um, he perhaps doesn't need to keep them. In the case of uh, an arahant, for instance, he, he has no more defilements um, in his mind. Various rules which are meant to prevent him acting, help him to act in unskillful ways, um, are no longer necessary for him personally. But he keeps them anyway, and or she keeps them anyway. And this promotes a great deal of stability um, in the uh, in the order, and it means that no one um, can use their spiritual attainments as um, an excuse or reason for not keeping the rules and following their own way, disrupting 
the community. So the first point I would like to make is that in any functioning and successful and sustainable community, a great deal of emphasis must be given to the rules, uh, laws, regulations um, by which that community has agreed to live. The second point is a harmony of view and understanding. We, as Buddhists, conceive of our religion or sasana as the ultimate or most comprehensive kind of education, uh, education of the whole human being. And uh, that being the case, our, our general attitude to life is of students, as being students. Um, and that includes the those of us at the um, in leadership positions. The only person uh, who has finished his studies, if you like, is the Arahant. Everyone else, including Sotapanas, Sakitagamis, Anagamis, enlightened beings who haven't yet realized the ultimate state, uh, are all for Seika Pugalas, they're all students. And that kind of humility is absolutely essential for a good leader. And if every one of us constantly remind ourselves that uh, we are students, we are still learning, um, and that as um, leaders, we have a great deal of opportunity of learning from our students, as well as teaching them. It, it must be a two-way process. As soon as the leader believes he knows everything that needs to be known, and he's always right, or she's always right, and uh, his or her duty and responsibility is to impart and share and teach other people, then that community is about to become dysfunctional and may well be dysfunctional already. Um, nothing lasting will be achieved because the, the opportunities for someone in leadership um, positions to become isolated and to believe their own thinking, believe their own publicity is very strong. And so today I, I'm, I'm interested not in just talking about um, leadership and the qualities of individual leaders, um, but talking about supportive structures. We can't talk about leaders apart from the lead. Um, we can't talk about leaders apart from the communities in which they live. And so um, I feel a, um, a conference or a, a general discussion, examination of the subject of leadership must also include a look at the structure of communities in which leaders live or which leaders lead. How can we create structures which support leaders? How can we uh, create structures which don't uh, allow leaders to become isolated don't allow them um, to become uh, lonely. Uh, we see in, uh, in monastic um, celibate structures, if the, if the leader becomes alienated from his disciples and starts to feel lonely, he can well seek for emotional um, sustenance from outside the monastic order. This is the beginning of relationships with women, which can easily develop into scandals. We have to be able to create structures in which there is emotional warmth and understanding within the community in which um, leaders don't have to seek outside of the community for that kind of support. Uh, going back to the, to the vineyard again, it is interesting um, looking at monastic communities in different parts of the Buddhist world and seeing how they, in each country and each culture, they have given great importance to certain aspects um, of the monastic discipline and less significance, less importance to, to others. And that the reasons for that choice tend to be obvious to the, the monks and monastic communities in, in each country, and they may not even be aware that they've made such a choice. So uh, my own experience, obviously, is, of, um, uh, is in Thailand. I would say that two, two main principles that we can see, one principle of, of hierarchy and respect for elders, um, this is uh, a principle which has been uh, maintained, upheld 
um, very well in the um, monastic order in Thailand. But there is a second very important countervailing um, principle, and that is uh, uh, one which goes by the technical term of Kawarana. Um, those of you um, any lay Buddhists will have, uh, have heard of the word Kawarana uh, in its meaning of um, offering invitation to monks for, for requisites. But the word Kawarana uh, uh, is used within the monastic order um, to mean offering invitation for admonition um, from one's fellow uh, monks or fellow nuns. And this um, principle is very weak um, in uh, Thai Sangha. I'm not so sure about other Asian Sanghas. I would imagine it is. Um, given the, um, the powerful uh, cultural um, <clears throat> um, aversion to or difficulty uh, with um, dealing with things openly and uh, in a manner which you could say confrontation, um, then that principle of Pawarana um, has, has rather got lost. And um, it's a shame um, because it maintains the health um, of communities and maintains the correct uh, relationship between leaders um, and communities, um, which the Buddha um, <clears throat> uh, desired. Um, the principle of Kawarana is that um, everyone in a monastic community um, right down to um, the most junior member, has a right to the responsibility uh, to admonish um, any other member of the community right up to the Jawat or even to the monks with the Jaya. Um, I would, I've almost never seen this um, take place in a correct manner um, in, in monasteries in, in Thailand. Very rare. Um, it's just so difficult emotionally um, to bring to bring things up in public or, or even on a one-to-one -one basis. And this is a skill uh, which really has to be introduced and developed and encouraged. Um, it's, um, it's not a Western idea. It's, it's, um, it's the Buddha's um, teaching. The Buddha's, it's a principle of monastic life, uh, which was laid down by the Buddha. And um, mutual admonition. And there are some wonderful examples of it um, in the Tripitaka. Um, most memorable, perhaps, is of Venerable Sariputta being admonished by a seven-year-old novice um, that his um, sabong uh, was on um, crookedly. And um, it's um, being preserved in the tradition that Venerable Sariputta took this with uh, a wonderful uh, grace and humility and put his sabong straight, um, even though he was the... Um, uh, you know, the great, uh, one of the two great disciples of the Buddha at that time, um, he was willing to listen and to, um, uh, to, uh, to recognize and acknowledge that, yes, he, um, he did have his bomb on um, in a crooked manner. Um, there are many um, other examples of this. So I think it's very important that we, are, we find ways of um, creating structures in which feedback can be can be given in a respectful, polite manner at the right time and place. This is a skill which uh, doesn't come easily for for any of us. But so many of the scandals um, that have hit the the Thai monastic order, of which I'm a part, or um, Buddhist communities overseas. In so many cases, we can see a breakdown um, of the process by which those in positions of leadership are reminded of and have their thoughts, their blind spots pointed out to them. Um, to say it's, it, it's almost impossible um, that um, it is impossible. The leader is going to be right all the time. And if the leader considers that his authority uh, resides in being perfect, infallible, right all the time, finds himself humiliated or his authority undermined by having his mistakes pointed out to him, um, then this is a recipe for disaster. 
So we're seeking to create communities where there's mutual understanding, uh, mutual respect, mutual forgiveness for, uh, for faults and weaknesses, and a sense of trust whereby we can, within a hierarchical system, whether it's, um, it's, a, it's a pronounced hierarchical system or a flatter kind of system, uh, one in which there is a genuine interest in receiving feedback, not just saying in a very sort of um, uh, perfunctory uh, kind of manner or saying because it's uh, expected of you to, uh, to ask for feedback, but through your body language, through your, your general attitude and manner, making it clear that you don't really want uh, feedback and you'll take it uh, poorly if you, if you do uh, receive any. So leaders, as leaders, we're, right, we're in a position where uh, we can reap a great deal of merit if we are uh, wise and we um, conduct ourselves in a correct way, but the stakes are much higher than people on the lower echelon, and um, the temptations are greater, and the opportunities uh, for us to get lost um, and to create great demerit are also there. So we need to uh, rely on our friends and to um, be able to create um, that kind of mutual trust and understanding. Um, the whole point, uh, the, um, interesting um, point about leaders um, that uh, I um, gained from reading an article um, quite recently discussing therapy and therapeutic models and different styles of therapists. And therapists here are, in a way, leaders or teachers. And looking at two of the dominant models for therapists, one is of the therapist as the um, infallible uh, person who knows who's going to sort you out. And the other model is of the, uh, the struggler, the person who's basically in the same boat as you, but is perhaps a little bit further along um, and knows enough to be able to help you out. Um, the study that was done was to compare um, the results of the two kinds of um, therapeutic approaches or the um, achievements of the different kinds of therapists. And it was found that the second kind of therapist, the therapist who was very um, honest about his or her own shortcomings and difficulties, was actually much more effective and successful than the therapist who, to create this uh, uh, image of himself as uh, being infallible and knowing everything that needed to be known. So as a leader, um, I think it's important to be brave enough to open up about your own difficulties, your own weaknesses, not to be sort of endlessly um, exposing them and um, um, going on about them at great length, but um, not seeking to hide them or to be hypocritical. Because if you are found to be um, acting um, and conducting yourselves in ways which conflict um, with what you're teaching other people, um, then you're going to cause a lot of um, confusion and anxiety uh, amongst members of your community. Um, so I think that honesty um, is always a um, the best policy, and fears that being honest um, about your own failings and difficulties will undermine um, your authority um, and people's respect for you um, are not borne out by experience. Um, I, I, I mentioned beginning different different models of leadership, and I'm a disciple of uh, Ajahn Shah, who, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, and uh, inevitably I'm, I'm uh, extremely impressed uh, by, by him. And um, uh, don't want to the point of just talking about uh, my own teacher too much, um, but um, I feel that one of the um, things he was most skillful in um, was in setting up um, an organisation which was able to survive his death. 
if you look at communities and organizations, generally, I think you'll find that wherever you have a really charismatic teacher on whom most of the power um, is devolved, then um, structures, the way of, um, of conducting affairs, everything uh, revolves so much um, around that particular person's presence um, that when he leaves or he dies, everything falls apart. And I've seen this in many uh, monastic um, communities and monasteries, um, that they have been unable to cope uh, with the death of their leader. Ajahn Chah um, gave a great deal of thought to this, and he avoided this by, um, through, through many very skillful means. One of them was in very skillful delegation of authority, giving trust to his disciples, giving them jobs to do, responsibilities, generally learning to stand back um, from the, a number of the affairs of the Sangha, uh, preventing everything um, depending on him alone. And as a leader, it's very easy to think that you are indispensable and actually to rather enjoy uh, that feeling of being indispensable and to ex experience a great deal of resistance uh, to delegation of authority. And, of course, um, there is um, a certain um, logic and intelligence to this. Is if you've been doing everything yourself um, and, de and demanding that everything uh, be done yourself, um, inevitably, um, other people are not able to do um, the things that you do as well as you do them. Um, and so whenever you do give someone a limited opportunity um, to take some responsibility, they don't do it as well as you do, and you're confirmed in the fact it's better that you do things yourself. Um, this, uh, I feel, is harmful um, to uh, communities, and it's harmful um, to the leader themselves. Um, the Buddha um, stressed on many occasions that our, we have a, a dual uh, responsibility. Um, we have responsibility to ourselves and responsibility to others. Um, and the Buddha did not praise um, devoting ourselves um, to the welfare of others um, if um, it means um, actually neglecting one's own welfare. Because um, if you do that, in the long run, um, you'll get burnt out, uh, your, your, your judgments will start to become impaired, um, you can easily um, get caught up in worldly dumbness, um, um, and uh, it's not a sustainable um, kind of um, situation. It's very, I feel it's very important that as uh, leaders, I should always remember um, that they are students, uh, that they have their own work that still needs to be done and should um, arrange their schedules in such a way that they have, uh, we have time by ourselves, time in retreat, uh, time for meditation practice. Um, there's, no, there's no virtue in just running yourself ragged in burning the candle at both ends and being totally exhausted, um, it's not something to be proud of. Um, it's, not, it's not a wonderful achievement. Um, you should be looking for uh, a way of um, being a leader uh, that you can enjoy. And being a leader in, in a way that you feel um, that your own spiritual practice um, is not declining, is not stagnating. Um, it, if you feel that you're having to give up um, your own spiritual practice um, in order to, um, to lead, um, then I don't feel in the long run this is a true Buddhist leadership. Um, as, you, as, you start, as you get too busy, um, your mindfulness, uh, your uh, certain 
power of circumspection, the quality of your judgment starts to wane. You start making more and more mistakes. And um, Buddhist leadership, it's not just what you do, it's who you are. Um, it's being as much as or even more than doing. And, and here I'd like perhaps get on to this whole subject of, you know, what is a good leader? Um, and um, I've spoken with many um, disciples um, of Ajahn Chah and asked them about their experiences with, with him in the old days and asked them for uh, particular teachings <laughs> that he gave them. Things that he said that they found particularly memorable, things that they still value and make use of um, years afterwards. And almost everyone um, had some particular anecdote, some particular teaching which they treasured and cherished and uh, were very proud of having received. And what was interesting to me in the course of my researches, which, which were connected with, with writing a book, were that um, very few, extremely few of these anecdotes are actually usable um, in the book that I was planning to write um, because um, written down, they just seem like uh, very simplistic or uh, cliches, things that everyone's heard a um, hundred times before. But hearing um, these people relate um, these stories and the teachings uh, with great emotion, reverence, you could see that at a particular moment, a particular time when they received that teaching, they were right for it. It was just the right time and place. And the teaching which they'd heard many, many times before penetrated their, um, their heart, penetrated their defenses, you know, of ignorance and craving and so on. Um, because of their faith and confidence in Ajahn Chah. We, I feel, have given uh, far too much importance in teaching to the role of conveyance of information and overlooked or forgotten um, the um, the importance of creating a situation in which that information can be received and can make real changes in the person's, uh, in the life of the person who has, where the teachers act in rather eccentric, unexpected ways, um, in order to snap the student out of their um, conventional a conditioned way of looking at things, you just open a, a gap which allows them to um, insert um, a teaching uh, which enables them to see things more clearly. And um, in our tradition, the, the, this kind of uh, skillful means um, is also to be seen. But generally, wherever there, the teacher, the leader, is able to inspire confidence and faith in the student, then the student um, is interested to listen and will remember what he or she hears. So um, a leader is not just someone who uh, can, can speak well or knows his staff, or knows her staff, knows all the information, but it's who they are. And that's not something that you can fake. That's something that comes about through your own long-term, uh, long dedicated effort to abandon the unwholesome, develop the wholesome, and purify your mind. Um, there, you can call it barami, or you can call it uh, whatever you like. But there is a spiritual authority which comes about um, through um, devotion to practice of sila, samadhi, and banya, which empowers your words and enables you to uh, effect changes um, in people's lives, in people's attitudes, um, and to create 
real or enable real progress um, in other people's in other people's lives. So this is something that um, I would really like to stress the the importance of one's own practice and also not to get discouraged um, if you're not particularly articulate. You're not a good speaker. You find it difficult to um, to string words together. Quite often, you'll be amazed at how much you can give without opening your mouth. And sometimes people actually give more when they're not opening their mouths than when they are opening their mouths. Um, and seeing people who uh, embody the teachings, seeing someone who is peaceful. Uh, we, we can read books and books about what peace means, but actually in the presence of someone who is peaceful, we understand it's a non-rational way, and it's so much more impressive. Seeing someone who is restrained, seeing someone who is content, uh, seeing someone with real integrity and honesty, seeing someone who's humble, um, the, all these spiritual qualities which are, have been developed and are embodied uh, by leaders. This is how we teach, this is how we lead, not just by what we do and what we say. Um, what we do and what we say can be measured. You know, there, are, there are tapes, there are videos, there are books, um, there are minutes of meetings and so on, which can measure, yeah, we've done this, and we've said this, and we've been here, and we've been there, and, and this can give uh, rise to a false sense of achievement, putting more time on the meditation mat, putting more time into solitude, and actually experiencing the truth of the things that you're trying to teach for yourself, um, can in fact um, be far more effective in the long run really for yourself, uh, finding um, refuge um, in sila, finding refuge in samadhi, penetrating the different levels of samadhi, experiencing them for yourselves, um, developing um, powers of wisdom, reflection, um, going into um, impermanence, dukkha, anatta, over and over and over and over again. Um, there is no conflict uh, between your own practice and your uh, role as a leader. In fact, if you do feel that there is a conflict, um, then you've lost it. You're not on the middle path as a leader. Um, if you find a, a reluctance to look at your own mind, a reluctance to be alone, a reluctance to do nothing, if you see this compulsive anxiety to be doing something all the time, that, for me, is not the quality of a Buddhist leader. Um, there's a wonderful um, uh, phrase uh, teaching by um, Vietnamese master, Thich Nhat Hanh, talking about, um, uh, he's, I think he's, he's um, uh, distinguishing cultural attitudes, Western, Eastern cultural attitudes. But anyway, I says the Western way is whenever there's a problem, uh, don't just sit there, do something. And he says the, the Buddhist way, the Eastern way, is don't just do something, sit there. And, and that ability to, uh, to see that just stopping and not doing something can be extremely creative. And it's, it creates the space within which creativity can take place. If you can't stop and just put down your thinking, put down your opinions, put down your anxieties, your desires, your aspirations, um, and come back to that, that empty space, uh, then your mind's going to get very cluttered um, and there's not going to be any real wisdom arises. You know, wisdom comes from peace. And the, the more um, you are intimate with the inner peace of the mind, then the more um, wise, reflective, um, effective um, you can be. So our model um, as uh, as leaders um, is that of the of the good friend, uh, the Kalyana Mita, and um, it, in 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 a way it, it seems kind of ironic that um, Buddhism, particularly Theravada Buddhism, is stressing self-reliance, 
um, self-sufficiency. Um, and yet at the same time, there is also um, there are also the Buddhist words that the, the presence of the Kalyana Mitra is the whole of the holy life. Um, so our goal is to be completely emotionally, spiritually self-sufficient. But in the meantime, we recognize that we're not at that stage. So we're, we're not coming from an ideal and trying to persuade ourselves or, or, or uh, compel ourselves to be the way we think we should be. Um, we start off from how we are, and right now we need guidance, um, all of us. And the Kalyana Mitta guides. So uh, we seek good friends, we seek Kalyana Mittas, no matter what our position in an organization is, we still need good friends, and they could be uh, amongst our, uh, our students. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be someone higher up in a hierarchical system. There, is a, there was a great um, Chinese monk who left the home life at the age of 60 on Tudong. And uh, he made a, um, a vow before he left home. He said, if I meet anybody along the path, even if he's as young as seven years old, um, I will learn from him. If I meet um, anybody along the path, even, as, even if he's as old as 90, then I will teach him. I will share what I know with him. This, this sense of giving and taking. Leaders, we're not just givers. Um, it's, we should be prepared and humble enough to take and be willing to take. We need that. Um, we have an in-breath and an out-breath, and that's the, the rhythm. That's the, the model for all of our lives. But uh, as, in general, people are looking to us um, as, as Kalyana Mittas, then we do have these guides of, you know, what, what qualities uh, a Kalyana Mitta, a good friend, um, should, uh, should embody. And um, we can look at those great teachers in Kalyana Mittas that may have had the good fortune to meet, just going through these qualities. Uh, the first one is the sense of the, the good friend or the leader as being lovable. Um, lovable here means um, you meet someone uh, like this, and you're just instantly attracted. You want to be close to them. Uh, you just enjoy being in their presence. You love being in their presence. Um, this is a quality of uh, the Kalyana Mitta. Um, uh, again, I, I was fortunate enough to, to experience this with Ajahn Chah. And, um, we, we would sit around in his cookie um, for hours and until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, you'd have to drive people away because you're there, you just couldn't get up. You, know, you, just, um, you just wanted to be there, or whatever he was talking about. And um, I, you know, I've, I've said to people before, listening to tapes of Ajahn Chah, actually, I, I'd be quite happy to hear him reading, uh, reading the names from the telephone directory. I mean, I just love to hear his voice independently of what he's actually talking about. So he ha had this quality of being incredibly um, lovable and then bringing up this kind of warmth and joy um, in the heart. Um, he inspired respect um, through his practice, the sense of the, um, being um, worthy of respect. And here, particularly in, in hierarchical uh, societies, there is this, um, unfortunately, it can often be this sense that when you're at the, the top of the line or you're the most senior, then uh, respect from others is your right. And then you can get angry and um, peaked or feel noijai, um, um, feel um, upset when uh, you're not treated with respect you feel is, is, is appropriate to you in your exalted position. Um, but uh, respect is, uh, is not your right. You don't have a, I think as a, a leader, um, you should be willing to give up all your rights, uh, be completely without rights. You don't have a right to be treated in any particular way. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but if you are sincere and dedicated in your practice, um, then people will naturally uh, feel a respect for you. And, and you can see this with certain people. Um, I know 
I can think of many monks who I'd be willing to travel um, right across Thailand and just for the privilege of bowing at their feet. And I'd be quite happy not even to have to live here five minutes of instruction and just get back into a vehicle and, and drive a thousand kilometers back to my monastery. But I have that sense of respect and, and um, I feel one of the um, disadvantages in my own position now I've been a monk uh, for over 20 years is that um, I, I very rarely get the chance to bow to other people. It's just people going to bow to me all the time. I, I feel this is a real lack in my life. And I, um, if I do get the chance to go somewhere and I meet someone who's actually senior to me and I get the chance to bow to them, it's, I feel um, great pleasure and happiness. Um, so, you know, being able to express uh, one's respect in that way and, be, and so constantly striving to be worthy of respect and that doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. And you know, some some people can think, oh, I'm I'm full of defilements. I've got all these faults, and everybody thinks I'm wonderful. This is this is terrible. I'm such a hypocrite. Uh, that that's another uh, wrong way of thinking. Um, the um, the point is, are you trying? Are you the sincerity? Are you consciously working to eradicate? your thoughts and develop your good qualities. Are you honest about where you are? You want to see deceive people. Um, so the, the, the leader is one who uh, inspires love, inspires respect, um, and he's someone who um, inspires, um, it acts as a role model, as an example. And um, this is the most important thing as a leader. Um, you, you, you show to people that this practice works, um, it's practical, it can be done, um, I've done it, or I'm doing it. That, that more than the intellectual assent to the practice is what really gets people practicing. Seeing, seeing monks or seeing teachers, seeing leaders, and say, look, um, they've been doing this for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years um, and um, it's, it's created these changes in them. This is wonderful. You know, I want to do this. I can do this. And so um, it's, it's empowering people through your own practice, your own example. And another um, aspect of this, this point or Pawanyo um, in Pali is is that um, it gives rise to development. It's to say, um, in the presence of a leader, of a good friend, you feel um, unwholesome qualities um, starting to fall away. You feel things are getting better. You're seeing things more clearly. Um, and the um, next one is the, the leader is someone who knows how to listen. Uh, it's just not it's not just a one way thing. He's he's interested in listening. Um, he gives he gives respect to the Dhamma, he gives respect to his students. He's interested in listening to what they have to say. He's interested in listening to criticism and admonition because he's studying. He's he, he, he uh, a leader has the qualities um, that the Buddha um, spoke um, of possessing um, before his own enlightenment, it's to say, um, unremitting effort and discontent with the wholesome states that he'd already attained. So this is the state of discontent that uh, is praised within Buddhism. Discontent with the wholesome. So the leader is is seeking to um, to develop himself the whole time. He's not content with what he's what he's attained. He's patient. He's able to sit and listen to complaints um, and unfair criticisms and uh, people's views and opinions, and he's able to sit there and be patient with it. He's someone who knows how to speak in a, uh, how to relate in a large group of people, in a small group of people. He knows with this person, uh, you need to be more direct. This person, you have to be more sensitive. He has that uh, power of empathy 
um, an ability to put himself in other people's shoes and ability to intuit um, other people's feelings, uh, power of empathy, are very, very important, and enabling him to communicate well. Um, someone who chooses his words well, um, speaks carefully, speaks things which are true, which are of benefit um, to his listeners at the right time and place, with metta, loving kindness, and in a polite um, and pleasant way. This we call the practice of the supasta, or the good, good speech. Um, he's a good communicator. Um, he's someone who is able to explain the most profound subjects um, in language which is um, simple and clear. Um, it's not that, you know, we use a lot of big words and um, difficult vocabulary um, and that that's, you know, that's being a successful communicator. And that this is a uh, um, very worldly value. Um, using words from other languages unnecessarily. Um, uh, whether, you know, if you're, if you're speaking with a, uh, an audience of scholars, uh, Pali scholars, then using Pali words is appropriate. If you're speaking with an international uh, or an audience who, who speak English fluently, then using uh, English technical terms every now and again is appropriate. If you're speaking with, with uh, people in your own country who have no knowledge of English uh, and you're sprinkling, splattering your sentences with big English words um, just to impress people with your, um, with your learning, uh, then you're losing uh, the whole point um, of, the, of, of the exercise, which is to explain, to exp inspire, uh, to elucidate. Um, so find uh, Ajahn Chah and some of the greatest teachers, what, what they are praised for, um, perhaps more than anything else, is their ability to explain the most profound principles of the sasana in everyday language. Ajahn Chah could use anything around it, whether it's a glass of water, flowers, a microphone, uh, a spittoon, uh, electric lights, just to, the things that um, around him to explain principles of prodigious samuppada uh, or the most profound and difficult um, Buddhist topics. Um, this, I feel, should be our goal as leaders to simplify, but not to oversimplify. Um, it's not that um, we don't want to um, go too far so, so that we're actually um, not bringing out the full um, splendor of the teachings, but um, to simplify where we can. And the leader never leads um, his students um, into unwholesome ways. Um, the leader does not encourage devotion to himself. Um, if you see any leader which is encouraging a personality cult um, around himself, then be very wary and don't let that happen um, to yourself. As a leader, you encourage and you, you inevitably um, encounter a lot of projection. People project their ideas upon you and interpret what you say and what you do um, in line with their, and their image of you. And um, you have to be very uh, clear about not buying into that, not um, allowing people to, to imprison you within their own ideas of who you are. Um, people ex have expectations of you. They want you to be a certain way, and they're very disappointed if you're not that way. There's a lot of pressure on you as a leader. Um, and you need a lot of strength to, to be able to deal with that. Um, there are a lot of temptations, temptations of wealth, um, sexual temptations, um, temptations of power. And as a leader, you, this is why you have to be constantly developing mindfulness and meditation, wisdom, um, not to be constantly checking and not allowing these basic cravings and desires um, how do, you're a leader, how does it feel to be powerful? How does it feel? How does it feel to be able to say, do this and people do it? How does it feel if you say, do this and people don't do it? Mm. You know, what happens in, what happens in your mind? Do you, do you exult in that? 
Um, you create an identity out of being powerful. How does it feel when members of the opposite sex come and say they think you're wonderful? Um, you know, what are the, there are temptations. Um, how do you deal with those? Um, money. Now, how many, uh, how many Buddhist centers, um, Buddhist monasteries um, are free from scandals and difficulties around the accumulation of wealth? Um, and then there needs to be the same standards of transparency um, and clarity around money matters. Um, we can't just say this, we're spiritual and we're not interested in these things. This, this, these things have to be dealt with in a, in a correct kind of way. You must protect yourself. You must protect yourself from your own weaknesses and also protect yourself from the uh, unfair uh, criticism of others. It's not just how things are, but how things look to be. This is why, as they say, as Buddhist monks, uh, we never speak with women alone, even if we're quite sure in our minds that um, it's an innocent conversation, um, something which is concerned with Dhamma. Um, but if it's a situation in which someone who wanted to create trouble for us um, could use it as basis for a slander, um, then, then we, we, we keep far away from that. We protect ourselves in that way. So being a leader, you're representative of something much larger than yourself. Um, and so you have a responsibility um, to uh, uh, maintain these very high standards of integrity. Um, and if you find that they're too much, then it's better you don't be a leader, um, because it's part of what it, that's part of what it means. Um, the higher you go, uh, the more worldly dhammas there are, and you have to be prepared for that. You're going to get praised a lot. Um, some of the praise will be fair and appropriate. Sometimes you will be um, praised ridiculously for things that um, uh, you know, far in excess of what, uh, of what you've achieved or what you've, what you've said. And you have to be, this is part of your practice as a leader. This is, this is what you're practicing with, dealing with praise, um, both fair and unfair praise. You're going to get criticized, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. How does it feel when you put so much time and effort into doing something with the most pure of intentions? And then someone comes along and says that you just did that because you want to be famous. You just did that because you want people to respect you. Or you did that because you thought you're going to get some reward from it. How does that feel? If you're going to be a leader, uh, you have to be able to deal with that. But it's going to come for sure. Uh, fair and unfair criticism. Uh, there's going to be progress. There's going to be decline. You may through, go through a period where everything seems to be going great, everything's expanding, everything, everybody's very harmonious, but it's not going to last. It's a condition. And don't be heed, heedless about it. Don't just think because things are expanding now that they're going to go on expanding. Um, there are going to be periods where there are going to be dips and they're going to be declined and you've got to be ready for them. Um, and when things are going badly, um, then don't get depressed, don't get too worried, don't, don't take it as being a personal thing. I'm terrible. I look, um, since I've taken over, everything's fallen to pieces and you think it's, it's all you. Look at the situation, understand it in terms of causes and conditions and just work very patiently uh, with the causes and conditions that, that are there. Um, they're going to be happy times, they're going to be difficult times. So, um, you know, these are the things um, that leaders um, we work with every day. The world we done this. Um, uh, gain, loss, praise and blame, happiness, unhappiness, um, prestige, and a lot, lack of prestige, uh, um, fame and decline. This is, you know, this is part of it, being a human being. Whatever environment, even if you're in a monastery, um, you're not free of the world of Um So um, leaders, um, then, um, just to, uh, to sum up, you know, there are many challenges. Um, there are things and qualities to aspire to, the qualities of the Kalyana Mitta, uh, for instance. Um, there are many uh, challenges. 
um, and things to beware of um, in terms of uh, increased power, uh, prestige, people's eyes are on you all the time, people's expectations, and dealing with that, um, creating structures in which there is mutual understanding, mutual harmony, supportive structures in which the leader is getting feedback and it's not becoming isolated and a, a, megal a megalomaniac. Um, sense of he feels part of this community and in fact in the communities in which um, the members of the community feels that the leader is in touch with them is connected with them is interested in them is interested in their views their opinions their fears um, their their desires their aspirations a sense where the, the leader is grounded in the community it's not just someone imposing from up above um, creating that mutual warmth and harmony in which the leader feels happy to be a leader and which the members of the community feel happy that he's their leader. Um, if, if some of these, I, I, um, I offer these uh, reflections to you for you to, uh, as a, in this keynote address as starting points for things that you can perhaps discuss and expand upon or uh, critique at your will, but I think probably for today that that's um, sufficient and I would uh, hope that uh, my words today will be benefit to, uh, to the assembly. Thank you very much.